Hey guys, it's the Tech Prepper. Hope you're all doing well. This is the last video in our Man Pack series. Last week, we took a look at the Yaesu FT818ND, and I said that every prepper should have this, and that still is true. The only problem is that this is a six watt rig. So in those scenarios where we need more power, we need to upgrade to something like the Yaesu FT857D. Now this is discontinued, but stick around because I'm gonna explain how you can still get this radio on the secondary market and everything it can do. And hopefully you'll be as impressed as I am with this radio's capabilities. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about what the Yaesu FT857D is all about. And by and large, it has all of the same capabilities of the radio we covered last week, which was the 818. So definitely take a look at that video because I'm not gonna go too deeply into all of the topics. The big difference between those two radios is size and weight, but more than anything, it's power. This rig will do 100 watts on HF, 50 watts on VHF, and 20 on UHF. So this radio will punch through even if conditions and operating environment are against you. So that's the big reason. Now, I think there's a place for both of these rigs uh, in terms of your communications uh, platforms or systems, mostly because it's going to be mission dependent on which one you take with you. So I do a lot of activities in the backcountry, and typically I prefer to take the 818 because this thing takes a ton of room in my pack. So I see the 818 as being more man portable, although as you'll see in some demos, this is also man portable. It just takes up more space in my ruck and competes with my support gear. Um, like I said, it's all band, all mode, just like the 818, so we can do uh, UHF, VHF, and HF. So very capable rig. It's what we call a shack in the box. It basically is like having multiple radios in one. Now, it also has a data port and CAT control, so I can make this operate uh, on digital data modes. I'm using the uh, DigiRig Mobile, and that has been my standard throughout this entire Man Pack series. Now, one issue that I'm seeing uh, with the DigiRig Mobile and specifically this radio and possibly the frame is that there are issues when I have the DigiRig this close to the frame. I'm still trying to track down what the issue is, uh, but the solution I found is if I take it off of the holster and just let it sit off by a couple of inches, I'm fine. All right, so the other uh, issue with this rig, uh, outside of some digital issues I'm working through, um, are basically the fact that it's discontinued. Uh, I don't know why Yesu has moved away from these all band, all mode rigs in this footprint and package. Uh, I don't believe that the Yesu, I think it's the 991A was a suitable replacement because it is twice the weight of this guy and that's not something you wanna take with you, man portable. The only other radio that's in this class is by ICOM and it's the ICOM 706 Mark II, uh, but that one has higher current consumption. So in my mind, this is the only radio that can do what it does in this footprint. So if you want one, unfortunately, you have to go either to Eham or eBay. And today in 2022, these things command a price used at about a thousand dollar price point. But bear in mind, this is absolutely the one radio, if you can handle the weight, that will do everything you need. So look at it as an investment. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the use case for this rig. Like I said, it's all band, all mode, and has the right amount of power. So that means we're able to communicate at the community level, your city, your county, your state, your region, like let's say the Southwest, the entire country, and even global. And I've done all of those things. In fact, in the next series, we're going to explore this radio, the 818, and to some extent, the VHF, UHF only rigs like the 8900 uh, to basically solve all of those different types of diverse communication needs in the series that I'm gonna call no random contacts. Like I don't care about making contacts with some random dude in Japan, nothing against the Japanese, but this channel is focused on targeted contacts with known quantities, so stick around for that series. I'm not sure if I mentioned it, but this morning I attempted to record a field video showcasing the power of this platform. And unfortunately, the audio crapped out on me and all the video was unusable. So instead, I'm gonna take some videos I've recorded in the past, and I'm gonna show you about three or four demos right now at about a minute each. There'll be timestamps. And I really just wanna demonstrate some of the capabilities of this rig. So this first clip is a summit on the air activation. 
Uh, basically, it's an activity that amateur radio operators uh, do if they want to spend some time outdoors, climb a mountain, set up a radio station on a peak, and make contacts. In this particular clip, I'm just going to show you uh, some VHF contacts. Well, guys, if I had known it was going to be that dangerous, this peak would absolutely be a no-no. Um, in fact, my recommendation is don't do the fortress unless you have a very ultralight pack. And if you decide to come up here, I think going with someone that knows uh, how to rock climb would be my recommendation. We had to drop our packs a handful of times. We had to really find our footing. But this is the uh, radio we're using today. It is the Yesu 857D. This is uh, Kilo Tango 1, Romeo Uniform November for Summits on the Air. Are there any stations? What was his name? Kilo 7, Tango Alpha Bravo. Hey there, Chris. Uh, K7TAB, you're 5959 into the Fortress in New River, Arizona. Yeah, Roger, Roger. You're a great copy here. 5-9 uh, as well. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. 73. Uh, QRZ? And 7 TAB. W7 Radio Victor, you're 5959. Okay, QSL 59, you're 57, 57 with me and Scottsdale. Uh, QRZ? Whiskey Alpha 7, Juliet Tango Mike. In this next clip, I want to show the single sideband capabilities on two meters. This is a mode that I really enjoy that for some reason a lot of people don't use. And like I mentioned in the last video, single sideband allows you to uh, basically use your power more efficiently compared to FM. It's also a mode that most operators uh, don't have equipment to listen on unless you have maybe an SDR. So it provides some uh, security by obscurity if you wanna think of it that way. Uh, but in this case, I basically have a two meter Yegi and I'm pointing it at a station that is well over 100 miles from my location. And I think I'm either running five or 20 watts on this rig. Let's check it out. And everybody was telling me to look into a directional antenna where I could focus uh, the beam uh, at their bearing and their location. And finally last week I went ahead and picked up an Aero 2 Yegi antenna. Um, the one that I bought is marketed towards uh, satellite operators but it works perfectly fine for my use case where I want to operate two meters in a horizontal dipole configuration. Kilo Tango 1, Romeo, Uniform, November. Okay, I got you uh, uh, there, Gaston. Taking one, are you in? Uh, good signal. I'm not even pointed your way, uh, but I got you on the list. Over. Yeah, sounds good. I can't hang out for the net, and I'm actually recording this for YouTube. Would you mind pointing out my direction? I just want to get a good signal report since I'm running a 2-meter Yegi for the first time on my roof. Back to you. Okay, so this next demo is a digital demo using uh, the WinLink email system. And all that means is I'm going to send an email using nothing more than my radio and my computer. And I wanna be able to send that email or check my email uh, basically in a grid down scenario. Now there is a station that I'm hitting that does need to be up. That station is about 40 miles from my, lo my location. So I pointed my Yegi antenna um, at that bearing and then that station is actually relaying it to a WinLink email uh, gateway. So we'll get into those details in a future video, but suffice it to say, with this setup, we're also being able to interoperate with anybody in the world who has a valid email address, even if I have a full grid down scenario where I personally live, like in my community. Let's check it out. So we haven't really scratched the surface on everything we can do with this rig. I'm gonna reserve that for the no random contacts uh, mega series. It's gonna be like an X-Files kind of season. We're gonna do at least 24 episodes and I'm gonna walk you through how to do just about everything with this rig and probably the 818 as well. Uh, before we do that, let's go ahead and talk about antennas. Just like the 818, um, this rig actually has the TPA pack frame 
and it has two antennas, which is kind of nice. So I have a VHF UHF antenna relocated here and an HF antenna on this side. So I want to walk through all of the antennas that I typically run. All right, so first and foremost, uh, since this is a 50 watt VHF and 20 watt UHF rig, I typically just use the signal link or signal stick uh, and drop that on the VHF side. So it gives me more than enough power uh, to be able to make uh, a lot of those FM contacts. I believe I showed it in the last video, but uh, I also like to carry with me the Pactena truck mount, and this allows me to run both FM and single sideband on two meters. And just like before, I have two antennas that I always keep in my kit, and I have it in our uh, kind of sidecar here, and that is two of the uh, Comet BNC 24 antennas. So uh, when I want to operate single sideband in the field, it's simply a matter of deploying this on top of my trekking pole. So if you guys are new to this video, check out the 818 video where I talk about this in detail. The other antenna that is always in my rucksack is a J-pole. This is good for two meter and 440 FM, and you can throw it up into a tree with a little bit of paracord, and this will absolutely get you out when the whip antenna won't. Uh, I also showed in an earlier part of this series how uh, if I, you don't have trees, which is uh, my situation, how I deploy this on my uh, portable mast. I have the carbon six carbon fiber mast that goes up about 19 and a half feet. So the J-Pole, absolutely a must-have antenna for VHF and UHF. All right, so in those two previous demos, you guys saw the Aero 2 Yegi. That's the backpacker model. And I have to tell you, if you need to make a targeted contact with someone that is a considerable distance away and you know their bearing, uh, you're able to focus all of that RF energy at their location. And it is absolutely one of my must-have top performers. Uh, I can actually break it down, put it in a small uh, tent stake bag, and stick that on the side of my Everly Stock Fact Track, like in the bladder that holds the my water bladder. And uh, that antenna actually does double duty. Uh, when I go into the field, occasionally I'll put it on top of the tripod. You guys saw that with the single sideband demo. But most of the time, it's actually sitting on a Mr. Longarm painter's pole at my shack and I basically rotate it depending on which station I want to talk to. So I've made contacts on this radio and all of my VHF rigs uh, to another ham on Simplex 40 miles away. I can hit every single repeater no problem in the entire Phoenix metro area and even uh, farther north from my position. Um, so really fantastic performer. And the cool thing about that one is that you can orient it um, vertically so that it works great for FM, but also horizontally so it can do single sideband. All right, there's one more VHF UHF antenna I wanna talk about. I told you that I bought my um, 857 used, uh, was about a year ago. And that gentleman also had the Yesu ATOS 120A antenna. The cool thing about that antenna is that it covers VHF, UHF, and HF. Now it's a compromised antenna, but it has a small motor. So when you mount this to your vehicle and you drive it with the, uh, the power of the battery pack that you have connected to this rig, it will actually automatically adjust the length of the, the coil so that you can work a bunch of different HF modes. So it really is a Swiss army knife. The downside is that it is a compromised antenna because it's not a full length antenna but I've had tremendous success when traveling, like in the RV, for example, to basically switch over to HF, go to 40 megahertz, and allow it to tune, and then I'm on the air. So not the greatest antenna, but it is the most compact, and sometimes that's all you really need to make a contact. All right, so let's now transition fully over to HF antennas, and since this is a all-band rig, sometimes we want to use the HF side, which is a wonderful tool if you guys have your general class license in the US. Now I showed some of the antennas in my antenna kit uh, from the last video, but I'm gonna kind of walk through the wire antennas. So number one, I don't use tuners, I prefer resonant antennas, and that means the antennas I pick are very much tied to the frequency that I wanna work. And the reason I do that is because I wanna maximize 
all the power that's coming out of this rig, and you do that by selecting an antenna that is frequency specific or uh, resonant. So this is the Pactena Mini and fed halfway for 20 meters. This antenna is great for making uh, DX or distance contacts. So typically when I use this antenna, I start to make contacts a couple states out. All right, so I showed this last time. I'm a firm believer of the dipole antenna, and I'm a firm believer in being able to build and maintain your equipment in the field. So this is, is an example of my homemade uh, dipole. This one is cut for 18 meters. And we'll do a, a video series on this antenna build as part of that no random contacts. And the reason why I like to have an 18 meter antenna is because it is part of something called the work bands. And basically those bands by gentleman's agreement are not permitted uh, for use during a contest weekend. So if the bands are completely crowded uh, for a contest weekend and you can't get through, I'll just switch over to the 18 meter band and make my contacts that way. And you can see for 18 meters, uh, there's not a whole lot of wire here. All right, so the next step up is uh, similar design. I'm using another Cobra head connector here. And uh, the only difference between this one and the last one is that I have a little bit more wire. And this one is designed for 40 meters. In fact, I built this with surplus wire I bought at the Goodwill. So this antenna was literally about $5 to build and very easy to maintain. So 40 meters is nice because it has a property where it's one of the first bands that will allow you to do local and regional communication without any infrastructure. You can have mountains in the way and it really doesn't matter. Now it's very time of day dependent, but in general, 40 meters gives me the ability to talk to, usually throughout the day, to everybody in my county, state, and sometimes even the nearby state. So 40 meter, dipole antenna. This next one is the exact same build. It's another Cobra head connector. Again, the only difference here is the amount of wire. And this is my either 75 meter or 80 meter antenna. And this allows me to basically have operations at night, again, for everybody uh, in my county and in my state. So basically everybody uh, within about 30 to 300 miles I can do with this antenna. So you can actually see that's not a whole lot of weight and gives me lots of different capabilities. So all four or five antennas fit in the palm of my hand. And for the most part, I can actually maintain these in the field if the line snaps with just a pocket knife and some electrical tape. So don't get too hung up on this. Bottom line is if you guys are serious about trying to make contacts without infrastructure, no repeaters, you have requirements of being able to talk to people, uh, 30 miles away to 300 miles away and beyond, all of these antennas will actually be able to do that with the 857. In typical fashion, we're gonna go ahead and take a look at a, not a full breakdown because obviously we've done a number of breakdowns and they're all pretty standard. So the heart of this platform is the Armorlock TPA pack frames. My version's a little bit different. I was an early adopter, so these are broken at a 93 degree angle. I think they're closer to like 91 or 90.5, I can't recall. So your look may be a little bit different. And again, they have the relocation mounts uh, for the BNC connectors for HF and uh, VHF UHF. Now the bag is very important when you transition to a man pack. This bag is actually the PRC 117 golf pouch that's a military style radio and is designed to work here but the footprint with the pack frames is absolutely perfect in fact if you have the yesu 891 which i also have there are frames um, that work with that radio and they also work with the same bag so no need to figure out what bag to get i got mine at high ground gear and this bag actually has a few cool features one thing I don't like is it doesn't have a top flap. It has this um, strap that goes over the top, but I haven't had an issue uh, with it, uh, especially the way that I operate. Now, everybody's always asking me about heat in all of these bags. I wanna say it one last time. I am a man portable operator. I want to hit targeted communication windows, so I don't operate more than 15 or 20 minutes. I operate in the shack where it's typically about 97 degrees Fahrenheit. It's not a problem there. I operate in the Tonto National Forest under 
shelter of my tarp shelter and I'll experience temperatures up to 110 to maybe 13 degrees Fahrenheit. And again, I don't have a problem doing the 15 to 20 minutes. Now, if you're concerned about that, this radio has a zippered compartment at the bottom that one will allow you to run it vented, but also access all of the different uh, components behind. So if you have to reconnect a cable, you don't have to fully pull this out of the bag. And as you can see on the backside too, there's a bunch of Molly, so this can be strapped to a plate carrier or just about any type of Molly or PALS compatible uh, webbing. In terms of battery power, again, I never run full power on this guy. Yes, it's a 100 watt rig, but in practice, I really only need typically on the top end about 20 watts. So the battery that I have chosen for this, based on those current consumption requirements to operate 20 watts, is just the BioWino 6 amp hour battery. Now, if I'm in the vehicle and decide to go vehicle mounted with this, yeah, I will either use the starter battery, I'll disconnect, and I have like a three foot patch cable that allows me to plug into uh, my distribution power block in the vehicle. I'll have to show you guys that video at some point. Um, when I travel in the RV, I don't have a full uh, connection to the starter battery. So I typically bring like a 12 amp hour battery, which is about twice the size of this. And that gives me the ability to run a bit more power than those 20 watts. But again, in general, short combo windows, and I run minimum power, and that's just a general best practice for this type of operation. So I don't want to hear, I can't run this without a hundred, with, with this battery in a hundred watts. So that's kind of the tour uh, on why this rig and this man pack is part of my overall communications plan and set of uh, tools at my disposal is the ability to basically talk to everybody from within my community to the globe and everywhere in between. So we're gonna start this No Random Contacts mini-series. Actually, it's not a mini-series, it's a full-fledged series of about 24 episodes. And I'm gonna talk about every type of contact. We're gonna do scenario-based, um, focused episodes. So scenario could be, I wanna talk to Charlie that is 41 miles from my location and I don't want infrastructure. How do I do that? Or my family is located in the next state, I need a have uh, communication with them if there is a natural disaster. How do I do that? So I'll show you that in that larger series. Now, the as part of the exercise, we're going to be looking at a number of antennas because the antennas are very critical on which one you pick. So we're going to get into some military field manuals that actually have chronicled which antennas you should use for those type of operations. But at some point in that process, we're going to talk about the chameleon um, light lightweight and fed sloper. And the reason why I accepted this antenna from Chameleon is because this has one property that allows us to be able to have a multi-band capable antenna. So I plan to use this to be able to talk across multiple bands without a tuner with this rig. So we'll get into that in um, that next big series that's coming. With that said, I wanna thank all the new subscribers. Uh, sorry for mangling the field video today. Hopefully you guys don't mind me being in my home office here. Um, I'm gonna to try to have all of the new videos be 100% field videos so that we can actually see what this looks like if you're displaced and have to operate away from the house. So with that said, guys, I'm the Tech Prepper. Be strong, be safe, and be prepared.